Okay, so welcome to History 233. Essentially what this is, is kind of like American History Part 1. So we're going to be covering all the way from Proto-America, Early American Exploration, all the way up to about Civil War Reconstruction. That is a whole lot of history to pack into essentially eight weeks. So there's going to be a whole lot of reading. You should all have received a textbook uh, by Johnson, Paul Johnson. He's a really good author. I like him a lot. I will say this about him and just for you kids at Calhoun and the campuses. Uh, this guy's a really good author, but he has kind of very much a very one-sided perspective on a lot of things. He kind of admits to this in his introduction. He's got, he's got a different, certain way of looking at things. So when you're reading this book, you're getting a really good general history of a lot of stuff, but you're not necessarily getting the whole story on every event. So take that with a grain of salt, you know, understand. Um, when you're doing the quizzes and when you're doing the, the lectures and all that, understand you're just getting a lot of that perspective and that feedback. So don't worry about going outside and having any other sources. You don't necessarily need to. When it comes to the quizzes, like the reading quizzes, they're all from the book, directly from the book. Um, okay, so course description, I'm going to pull this down. I don't know if the Calhoun kids can see this, but I, I'm going to try my best to like get it working. Um, let's see if I can get this thing going. There. Okay, so uh, this course traces political, social, economic, and cultural developments from the colonial period through Reconstruction. Cause and effect in our relationships among individuals, issues, and events are emphasized. Interaction with primary source documents facilitates critical thinking and historical insight. This course is designed to satisfy the state legislative requirement in U.S. and Georgia history. So, little announcement on that part. Last year, uh, our kids did not have to do this. We are adding Georgia history into this American history class. It's, we have to do a little bit of that. It's going to be pretty cool. There's actually a lot of fascinating Georgia history. We actually are very strongly tied to things like the Trail of Tears, uh, some Civil War stuff, even American Revolution stuff. So we're going to get a little bit into that. There will be videos on the website, which I'll show you some of, um, that you'll be having to do discussions on, and that'll be really fun. Okay, so the next thing on this is the point, the course objectives is to gain a basic understanding of the topic, uh, develop knowledge and understanding of diverse perspectives, global winners, and the cultures. It's a little bit harder to do with American history because essentially we're studying our own cultures and where we came from. So it's still there, but we're not going to be looking at other world cultures so much. Um, learn to apply course material. That one's going to be a big one because, again, I guarantee you that all the quiz stuff is going to be from the course material. The papers you're going to be writing, you're going to get to use that textbook. So that textbook's going to be your bread and butter. Um, we'll get to what you have to do on the course schedule for the reading of that. Um, to gain a broader understanding and appreciation of intellectual culture activities such as music, science, and literature. In this case, really, it's history. So, um, developing skill in expressing yourself orally or in writing. This is going to become in the format of discussions. Now, you all have done this before. Um, I've already graded some of your discussions from the previous class. I think some of you had geography. Um, so you know what I'll be expecting from those. Mainly, um, I want to be able to give you easy hundreds in discussions, and I'll say this to the kids at Calhoun. Best way to do that is when we will go over the discussion instructions, but just follow them, just do the discussion, actually put effort into the discussion. You know, one word answers, one word replies, or just flat out not doing the assignment, you're not going to get a score for it. If you actually do the assignment and you put some effort into it, it should be a pretty easy hundred. So, all right. Um, develop ethical reasoning and or ethical decision making. This one will actually be more in depth to on some of the weeks because we'll be discussing some of the pretty controversial issues about the about America, essentially, like how do we become what we became? What were some of the darker sides of America? Let's give one big one. What do we know? Slavery. Slavery. That's a big one. We will definitely be getting into that for at least one to two weeks just because of Civil War reconstruction and all that. So uh, learning to analyze and critically evaluate ideas, arguments, and points of view. Now, this one, again, uh, will be a really good one to discuss because like, even if we talk about the Revolutionary War, I might ask you about the British point of view. I might ask you about the American point of view or the colonial point of view. Like, what, which side had, was justified? Were they both justified? We'll get into that. Okay, so uh, important dates. Move this down a little bit. Hopefully you can see this, uh, Calvin kids, and hopefully I'm not blocking. All right, so first day of class today, obviously. Drop ad deadline is uh, January 20th, so that's, I think, two days from now. I'm going to double check on my phone here. Yeah, so two days from now. You have two days from, from today to decide whether or not you want to take this class. Um, I really encourage you all to do it. It's not a hard class per se. It's not complicated, but it is very involved. There's a lot going on with it, so a lot of work. But if you do that work, I think you're going to do just fine in this class. Um, midpoint, Friday, February 11th at 5, so it's the last day to withdraw completely without academic penalty. 
Um, all work will be due by March 10th, Thursday. So think of the last week, Thursday is kind of a short week. I'm going to move some due dates, I think, back a little bit, but I might open up things a little earlier too to give you kind of some extra time. Um, last official day of class is Friday, March 11th. I will also go to another date that is exceptionally important. It's actually in the course schedule. And to you kids in Calhoun and there are kids here, you need to do this like today. If you haven't done the course documents quiz, or it's also called the check-in quiz, you need to do it today. It is due in two days, but if you don't get it done by five, you're basically kicked out of the class. And it's a very easy check-in quiz. You're basically just saying, yes, I have read the terms of license and agreement, blah, blah, blah. It's that kind of thing. You're just taking the quiz. It's an easy hundred. You just got to do it. So um, go on to your web, your class page, access that. I do know that over the weekend, it was a little bit difficult to access the class page. I think their power was down. They have fixed that, so you should be able to get in there like today. It shouldn't be a problem. So, um, okay, moving on. Let's see if there's anything super important on this one. I think we can skip quite a bit of this. So, we already went over the textbook. It should be your textbook should be Paul Johnson, the History of the American People. You should have gotten an online textbook, I believe, from Ms. Corey. So, shouldn't have anything crazy to cover there. If you do not have your textbook, please email Ms. Corey immediately. So, we definitely want to have that. Um, this is just important information on online courses. Nothing. Uh, let's go to the requirements and grading. Okay. Requirements and grading. So, always be sure to check the submission status of any assignment when completing it. Okay, so I'm going to go over this real quick. When you're submitting papers uh, into TFC, it's a little different than, say, like submitting a PDF to me. When you submit the paper, you have to click it twice, believe it or not, because if you click submit once, It'll say like submitting or whatever, but it won't fully submit. It'll just be like, oh, it's ready for submission. And then you gotta click it a second time. And it should say submitted. It should read submitted and I'll get it. I've had a lot of students who are like, I totally submitted the paper. It's like, I'm sure you did, but did you click it twice? Whoops, no, and then the paper never came in. So when you're turning in papers or submission assignments, make sure that it does say submitted. Just, I know some of you probably know that already. If you've already taken other classes, you've gone through the same thing. Okay. Check in for the course. Uh, students must check into their course during the first three days of class, uh, or be dropped in this case, first two days. Um, so we just went over the check-in quiz. That's what that is. Um, let's see. Yeah, if for, any, if for any reason you are unable to access the check-in quiz or cannot access the page or whatever, email me like immediately. That way I know, and then I can push it back. Because then I know you tried. If you just wait and then don't do it, I can't really do much. Um, OK, so we already covered course documents, quiz. Um, and 6% of the final grade, so if you want an easy 6% A, just do these on that. Easy. Um, okay, reading quizzes. So, there will be eight open book, open note, objective quizzes. Now, let me emphasize before I get into detail about either of these. There's going to be two types of quizzes, and there's going to be eight of each. So, there's going to be 16 quizzes total. There will be eight reading and eight lecture. Now, every week, you're going to have lectures that will actually be posted on each week's page, and they're by Dr. Melton, who is the, technically the original professor of this class. So what do you think the lecture quizzes are probably going to be covering? What's on the video lectures? What's on the video lectures? That's all you need to know. So if you're worried about lecture quizzes covering stuff in the book, you can use the book to help you, but almost 95 to 100% of the give or take is pretty much going to be from his lectures. That's the lecture quizzes. Now the reading quizzes are going to probably be from what? The book. Pretty easy. So, reading quizzes. There are going to be eight open book, open note, objective quizzes covering the reading assignment each week. They are softly cumulative, meaning that while they are primarily covering the reading that week, and I've got to be fair here, some questions might be from some earlier sections or from later sections. It won't be like crazy, like you're not going to see a question from like 100 pages later, but it might be just a few pages ahead or behind. Now, I want to emphasize something because we ran into this last year and some students didn't listen to me because I read the textbook before I even taught the class and then I even took the quizzes myself. Do the reading first. Do not rely on the open book because there is a lot of the open book that you have to cover each week. So if you're trying to find those informations and do the keyword search, you'll be surprised at how many questions will trick you. Uh, and they'll come off as, oh, that's totally answered in this. And then you read it and then you look closer and you realize, oh, that's not the right answer. I had at least five or six students send me emails last. Oh, Mr. Belcher, I, I went to this page and they said this was the answer. And I was like, let me check. 
I went on it, and it was like, nope, they didn't read closely enough. They just tried to skim it, tried to get the question. So I highly, highly encourage you to read first. Do the reading one time, all the way through first, so that in your mind you can take, and I would highlight things, highlight things that look important. Um, I would highlight like major points, uh, major names, uh, like I'll give you one right now, uh, Richard Hackliot. Richard Hackley, that's H-A-K-L-Y-U-T. Um, that will probably be on your quiz, I can give you that one. So, uh, but there will be a few others that, um, if you're not careful, they will trip you up. So that's just a bit of advice. Obviously, you can do it your own way. You will get two attempts for each quiz. So if you really mess up the first time, I wouldn't just take it again immediately. If you really do bad at the first time, Go back and reread and see see what you um, see what you missed. I don't think you're able to access the quizzes. Some classes allow you. This one does not. Um, and I really I, I kind of keep Dr. Milton's station on that one because I really firmly believe you should do the reading more than rely on what you got wrong. Um, so students should know that common themes do appear in multiple sections and will be tested repeatedly. Students will have one hour to complete 20 questions. So one hour is a decent amount of time for 20 questions. So if you need to use the book, it is there. And you'll have that option. Um, you will automatically be submitted when the time is up. So let's say if something happens and the power goes out or you, you leave and you didn't submit the quiz or whatever, it's going to submit itself within an hour. Um, so if something does happen where like the power went out, email me immediately, say I was doing the quiz, power went out, can I please get another attempt? I have the ability to go in there and add another attempt if you email me and let me know. Um, that all depends on the situation. Because of the asynchronous nature of online learning and the ease of cheating, answers will not be displayed. So and, uh, to go over what I just said about that, and I agree with Dr. Mullen on that, you can't just go back and see which ones you got wrong. And if you see a question that you think you got wrong or think you got right or something and you're concerned about it or whatever, let me know. Again, I can, as a professor, can go in and literally look up what you answered and we'll fix that. Lecture quizzes. So it's going to be very similar to the reading quizzes. There's going to be eight open note objective quizzes that will pull directly from the themes and information discussed in each week's online lectures. These quizzes will be cumulative, broad knowledge, and it's the same thing as the reading quizzes. Students will have a half hour to answer 10 questions. So it's half the questions, but half the time. Um, this shouldn't be too hard because the lectures aren't super long. Uh, he's very to the point, and I really like him. He's got like these PowerPoints, he's very to the point. So if you take all the major points that he puts on, you should be very well on lecture quizzes. Um, you may not get the same question on each attempt, and this goes for both sets of quizzes. If you take the same quiz again, you're probably going to get some different questions. There's like a question bank of over 200 plus possible questions, so out of 20. So you're probably going to get some different ones. Um, also, on, that, on the note of the quizzes, I don't think we're going to be getting into it today, but normally speaking, like starting week two, we will be playing Jeopardy games, and they will cover um, a lot of the broader questions. They will not cover every single possible question, but they will cover most of the themes of that uh, particular thing. And I take those questions directly from the quizzes. So, just so you know, some of those questions, if you memorize them all, you'll have a, already like a decent start. Um, okay, so discussion boards. Now, discussion boards are actually new for this class. I don't remember there being any extensive discussions in last History 233. There might have been one or two. Um, so, students will participate. I'll move this down, I'm sorry. Uh, Calvin students, I'll move this down for you just in case. All right. Students will participate in four discussion boards over the course of the class, three of which, three of which focus on the course of Georgia history. These boards will be assigned or on assigned topics, and the students must respond to the initial post on the board before replying to at least three of their peers. So that's three replies. One main post, three replies. So that's four total. You want to write that down, I encourage you to. So one main post and three replies. And I will be looking for them. Um, each main post, so for post number one, should be 250 words. That's really not that much. It's maybe a couple paragraphs, two or three paragraphs. So each main post should be at least 250 words and no more than 500. Uh, if you go a little above 500, I'm not going to dock you. I'm, just, I'm not that kind of professor. It's like if you hit 515, I'm not going to freak out and be like, Hur! you know, so it's going to be totally fine. If you get 500, that's fine. Um, full credit will be awarded to students who complete all post, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, replies need to be 100. So all replies need to be 100. Think about that. So each reply is going to be at least a paragraph to two paragraphs. So one sentence answers won't cut it. One word answer certainly won't cut it. So 
in order for me to be able to give you the full 100, I have to be able to see those replies. They don't have to be perfect replies with everything right, uh, whatever, but they do need to be courteous. They do need to be on point with the topic. Like, they're not just fun discussions like, oh, speaking of which, my dog went and did this the other day. It needs to be about the topic on hand. So as long as you do that, you guys are used to that, shouldn't be a problem. I'll be able to give you easy hundreds for that. Full credit will be awarded to students who complete all posts and make substantial comments, prove their points using evidence, and significantly contribute to the uh, conversation. Also, to help you out, I encourage you to use the textbook. Like, if someone brings up a subject or brings up something that you agree with or disagree with, go to the textbook and say, well, yeah, but Paul Johnson really says this, blah, 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 or I think it's great that you make that point. Paul Johnson also says this on page whatever. Totally fine. I encourage you to do that. Uh, students are encouraged to disagree with each other, so play devil's advocate. That might help you with the discussion. Like, if you're bored and you just don't know what to discuss, create an argument. Have fun with it. Be nice, but create an argument. Say, well, yeah, you could see it that way if, you know, you're a high school student, but obviously as a college student, you look at it like, I'm totally, you don't want to be that mean. But essentially, create uh, a discussion, create a problem. So, don't, no abusive, no insulting behavior will be tolerated, that's obvious, no, no swearing, no cussing, no calling people out, obvious. Each board will be 3.5% for a total of 14% of the grade, and that should actually match the course schedule, which you should be able to see. Um, and we'll go over this course schedule in a bit. Alright, historical application essays. This is where we have to get to some of the meat of the, the meat work. Uh, okay. Students will be required to write two short essays applying to one prompt chosen from a given set for each assignment. Students should put together a coherent five-paragraph essay with a clear thesis taking a position on their chosen topic. The positions must be proved using evidence from the class and not simply assumed. So you're going to have to show me you did the reading and what you're talking about. You've actually got some evidence from the textbook. As far as I know, and we'll check this in a minute, I think you only have to use the textbook. I think that's the only source of your uh, textbook and lectures, excuse me, textbook and lectures. So you don't have to go crazy and go outside. If you want to get one or two extra sources to help you, that's fine, provided that they're valid, published, scholarly sources. I'm, I'm personally okay with that. It's my, my course, so I can, I can go with that. Each essay is worth 10% for a total of 20% in the final grade. Structurally, each essay should begin with an introductory paragraph, ends with a strong argument and thesis, then you're going to have three body paragraphs and a conclusion. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because that is a basic essay format. Alright, to receive full credit, students must properly cite from both the lectures and Johnson. Students should note that simply citing sources twice is the minimum and does not guarantee a passing grade. So let me let me reword what this says because this is one of those you could do it this way, but you know, make sure that anytime you make a claim in your paper, you have a source. Easy. Win. Like, you'll, you'll never go wrong with that. Uh, again, I will never dock you for using a lot of sources if you think that it helps your paper. It's just not something I'm going to do. It shows that you put a lot of concern and effort into making sure that you did your research. So, um, to receive full credit, oh, I already did that. Let's see. Our essays do not cite sources, our essays that do not cite sources at all cannot score any higher than a 70. So, if you leave out your work cited page or your in text citations, I can't give you more than a 70. And in some cases, we actually had this happen with one or two students. I don't think it was in history, it was another class, it was geography. We caught two students who they flat out plagiarized. They literally copy pasted from the textbook or from another website and did not cite it at all. And we caught them, and that was one. So just don't do that. Always cite your sources if you're concerned. Just when in doubt, cite. Um, students should use the College Card MLA formatting for this assignment, so MLA 8th edition, or if you prefer MLA 9th edition. I know that TFC seems to be getting into MLA 9th edition. I think that's the new version. I can take either because I'm getting used to both. There's not really much of a difference um, in MLA 8th or 9th. They're basically the same. I think there's some new pronouns for the for the more progressive. It's, I think it's like they them now. That they I just do your thing as long as you're you're within MLA, you're fine. I'm gonna I'm not gonna. Okay, each essay should be 500 to 600 words long, double space. So these essays aren't long, but they do need to be direct, meaning to the point. So, please note all assignments must be submitted in PDF formats to allow for inline feedback, because the way that the TFC program works is I can go into the PDF that has been sent to me, download it, and actually put comments and stuff on it directly from their program. So it must be a PDF format. It cannot be any other format. Um, otherwise, it won't really work. I had a student try to submit a Microsoft Word directly into the format, and it didn't show up. So it has to be PDF. So in case you couldn't hear that, Alex, students, your papers do need to be in PDF format. All right. Um, 
Any work submitted in any other format will be treated as late until you submit the proper format, so let's just put that all together. Okay, so that being said, I think we're mostly good to go on all the other stuff. Let's see if there's anything quick I want to go over. Make up late work, academic honesty. Okay, make up late work, uh, yeah, let's quickly cover that. Basically, um, make up late work will be made at the discretion of the professor. So I decide whether or not I think that a make up or late work assignment is valid. If it's a medical thing or an emergency thing, of course, I'm always going to let you have a make up. If it's, well, I just didn't do it in three days in my bed, you know, it's like, well, you can still turn it in, it's going to be docked. You know, I mean, it's better to turn it in and not get a zero, but there's going to be a deduction. So most of the time, if you appeal to me with a valid reason, I'm going to give it to you. Um, okay. Let's see. Academic honesty. Real quick for you guys, we're not even going to go down this whole huge essay paragraph of academic honesty. Basically, don't cheat. Again, very easy. Um, do not plagiarize. It's very easy for me to catch plagiarism because I have this little thing called Grammarly, which I love, because I can just take your paper, if for any reason I have any doubt that it might be plagiarized, poke it into Grammarly and go, is it? And it'll be like, yep, that line, that line, that line, there's the website they got it from. I love it. I save you so much time. I know most of you probably won't do that, and I've never had a reason to believe you would, but just, you know, for you Calico kids, for the kids here, and eventually the kids in Rutledge, just don't do it. You know, safe bet is don't cheat. It can happen. Um, okay, course drop. Students drop out courses through the internet using TFC self service. There's a drop out period at the beginning of each session, and the student should consult the college catalog for specific dates. In session B, I think we're in session A, but in session B, the drop out period is the first two days of class for online. It might be in session B then. Uh, when a course a student drops a course, it is removed from their schedule completely. Um, so that's if you want to do that. I, I don't see anyone doing it, but if you want to, that's okay. There's no shame in that. If you just decide this class just isn't for you, that's cool. Um, moving on, I don't think we've got anything crazy to cover. Anything else? Great appeal. We just went over that. Tutoring services, disability. So, disability. Yeah, we do need to cover disability real quick. Uh, if you have any designated disabilities for whatever reason, uh, I believe you get extended uh, testing periods if you have med uh, physical mental impairment, which limits uh, one or more life activities or has a record, blah, 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 blah. Um, Disability Service Coordinates provides a variety of academic and support services based on individual needs, so you need to contact that department if for any reason you have that. Um, tutoring services, uh, you can actually email tutor at tfc.edu if you feel like you need tutoring for a class like this or any other class. We go over that, you guys know that. Um, but it is available to you, and I will say, well, like I said, while this course isn't exactly hard, there's a lot of it, so if you feel like you need a tutor to help you organize some thoughts, totally fine. So, um, I'm also open to theoretical tutoring if everyone wants some extra help, I'm, I'm totally down to do that. Um, okay, so, let's go over our course schedule, and you've got the sheet on, oops, you've actually got this thing I gave you. So, you're going to notice that... I read this correctly, you technically have two course schedules. They're the same thing essentially, but one of them has the dates when everything is due and the grade weight. That's the first one. So you're actually going to see, like for example, uh, you've got reading Johnson 3 through 127. That's a lot of reading. You've got the, the presentation introduction. These are the lectures, by the way. Presentation, early exploration, and presentation, diversity of British settlement. Then you've got reading quiz number one, lecture quiz number one, and the course document quiz. And you'll notice I put this ends on the 22nd. However, the CDQ, which is the course documents quiz, ends on the 20th at 5. So that gives you the end date and the grade weight, which you should be able to access via your college page just in case this doesn't about this here. For the course documents, does it get one and it's 20 minutes? What's yeah. one? Uh, like I said, it's basically do you agree to, it's a very easy question, it's, it, it's did you read this, did you do this, it's okay. literally yes or no, like yes, I did. It's, you're not, it's an easy game, okay. it's an automatic 100 basically, um, so it's going to be a very, very easy start, that's why I would say just get it done, get it over with, and knock it out. Honestly, if you want what I would suggest doing today, I would not even suggest worrying about the other two quizzes necessarily today, if you want to do them, you can, I would get the reading done. That's what I would do. Spend all the rest of today, if you have time, get through that reading. Make highlights, all that stuff. Um, I know it's a lot. It is a lot of reading. Um, and it's just one of those things that because we have a lot to cover in that first week, there's a lot. The good news is, and you'll notice, the rest of the readings are not that long. The rest of the readings are anywhere between 20 to 50 or 60 pages, not 100 something crazy pages. You will not have that every week. Okay. Now, on the second version of the course schedule, you'll you'll also notice the course weighting, which is all kind of summarized, and I think it should all look the same. It might, it might be a little different off here, because we added the totals. Yeah, it's basically all the same. 
Um, but what also you'll notice is that it gives you a PDF pages reference. So the PDF is different from the physical book. So the pages will be different because the pages are larger and there's got more per page on the, on the PDF. So these PDF uh, things tell you what pages on the PDF to read. So, yeah. When citing, you cite the PDF? Yes, yeah, you can cite the page on the PDF. Um, yeah, because, and, and I, would, I would try to find a way to specify this electronic, but I know you don't need to because I know you're all using that, so uh, that's not necessary. Um, as long as you provide a page number, that it should give it to you on the, the top of the reader. It should give you a page on. Um, but that's why I got you two of those, so that you have a course weight and you also have the PDF pages. Now, the next thing is this gives you the overall percentages, the course um, for like all of the combined things, like what are the quizzes worth, what are these worth. So uh, place emphasis on what you think is the most important. You can tell that lecture quizzes and reading quizzes are a big chunk out of all of it. So make sure that you're being very careful with those. Um, your discussion boards are 14%, but again, provided you're doing the discussion work, it's easy. That's an easy A. Course document quiz, easy A. Historical application essays, provided you write carefully, should be easy A's. Be, you know, uh, A's. The ones I'm more concerned about are the lecture quizzes and the, and the reading quizzes. Those are the toughest part, in my opinion. Um, okay, and that's really all we have. Do we have any questions now that we've covered all that craziness? No? Okay. Yes? For the essay stuff, can you correspond with a classmate for advice? Sure. Um, I, I wouldn't use them as a source, like I would cite them, but yeah, if, if, you, if you're not sure like about a topic or like maybe you don't quite understand the topic you're trying to write about and you want like your student, you know, like other students input, absolutely, totally fine. If y'all want to write, I wouldn't write the essay with the same essay, but if y'all want to like have a study group and actually like work on your essays individually like in a group or something, that's totally fine too, I encourage that. So um, again, I go back to because there's so much to do, it's just one of those things that if you can work together and get it done even faster, I just, I encourage it, absolutely. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do now, let's see, we are at 10.57, so we still got a while. You know what? I think we got time to watch one crash course and then play the Jeopardy game. I mean, we may not get through all the way through the Jeopardy game, probably not, but we can at least look at some stuff on the Jeopardy game that you're gonna, you're gonna wanna know. So let's start with the crash course video. And I might pause it a couple times to just talk about some stuff. Uh, it's, let's see, this is a 12 minute long, yeah. Uh, I, I might point out some interesting factoids or just things that I think you might want to take note of. Keep in mind that the stuff in the Crash Course video is not necessarily directly on the quizzes. Remember, what's on the quizzes is from your readings to your lectures. But these Crash Course videos might give you a broader understanding of the topic we're going to be covering in that period. So I'm going to turn the lights on real quick. Movie. This guy's pretty entertaining too. This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to tell the story of how a group of plucky English people struck a blow for religious freedom and founded the greatest, freest, and fattest nation the world has ever seen. These Brits entered a barren land containing no people and quickly invented the automobile, baseball, and Star Trek, and we all lived happily. Ever after. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, if it's really that simple, I am so getting an A in this class. Oh, me from the past. You're just a delight. So most Americans grew up hearing that the United States was founded by pasty English people who came here to escape religious persecution. And that's true of the small proportion of people who settled in the Massachusetts Bay and created what we now know as New England. But these pilgrims and Puritans, there's a difference. Weren't the first people or even the first Europeans to come to the only part of the globe we didn't paint over. In fact, they weren't even the first English people. The first English people came to Virginia. Off topic, but how weird is it that the first permanent English colony in the Americas was named not for Queen Elizabeth's epicness, but for her supposed chastity. Right, anyway, those first Virginia. English settlers weren't looking for religious freedom. They wanted to get rich. So the first successful English colony in America was founded at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. I say successful because there were two previous attempts to colonize the region. They were both epic failures, the more famous of which was the colony in Roanoke Island set up by Sir Walter Raleigh, which is famous because all the colonists disappeared, leaving only the word Croaton carved into a tree. And I'm going to pause this for a second because I want to stress a term that Paul Johnson uses and Dr. Mellon kind of emphasizes, proto-American. 
Proto-American. So this period is like early, early colonial, and it's kind of proto-American, meaning it's America before America had really been founded. Um, but you're already seeing a lot of the traits of the American spirit, the American people. They were, they were uh, concerned about money, they wanted to make money, they were very ambitious, uh, very hardworking, uh, very stubborn. Um, probably not always, I wouldn't say not smart, but, probably, but just uh, often reckless in some ways. So kind of you already see these traits of, you know, that America that we know and love is already happening here, and the term would be proto-American. One of the first major proto-Americans was Sir Walter Raleigh. He might have even been the quintessential proto-American, Sir Walter Raleigh. Um, so, and this is cool. Well, Jamestown was a project of the Virginia Company, which existed to make money for its investors, something it never did. The hope was that they would find gold in the Chesapeake region like the Spanish had in South America, so there were a disproportionate number of goldsmiths and jewelers there to fancy up that gold, which of course did not exist. Anyway, it turns out the jewelers disliked farming, so much so that Captain John Smith, who soon took over control of the island, once said that they would rather starve than farm. So in the first year, half of the colonists died. 400 replacements came, but by 1610, after a gruesome winter called the Starving Time, the number of colonists had dwindled to 65. And eventually, word got out that the New World's one-year survival rate was like 20%, and it became harder to find new colonists. So in 1618, so, say, a imagine if you were living in say, England, and you really want to travel this new America place, and they tell you, alright, the survival rate is 20%. You know, a one in five chance of living. Would you want to go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most people theoretically know, but what else was over here that they thought would, would help them? It's a new land, so... I kind of, kind of gave you the answer. Begins with an L. It's new, it's land, it's land, it, it's opportunity, okay? So theoretically, you can come over here, get rich, make a lot of money, or even get new land, or come back over and bring those riches over, which is exactly what a lot of the Jamestown colonists thought they were going to do, is we're coming over to America not to stay, not to live permanently, but to essentially get rich quick and then come back. So that's kind of what the, uh, the first major colony uh, Jamestown was doing, and if you can imagine, if that's your goal, are you going to do a good job establishing a base for staying? No. Not really. Not really. It changed with Captain John Smith because he came in with essentially a military attitude and said, okay, we've got to change. We've got to organize things. So. On a recruiting strategy called the head rank system, which offered 50 acres of land for each person that a settler paid to bring over. And this enabled the creation of a number of large estates, which were mostly worked on and populated by indentured servants. Indentured servants weren't quite slaves, but they were kind of temporary slaves, like they could be bought and sold, and they had to do what their masters commanded. But after seven to ten years of that, if they weren't dead, they were paid their freedom dues, which they hoped would allow them to buy farms of their own. Sometimes that worked out, but often either the money wasn't enough to buy a farm, or else they were too dead to collect it. Even more ominously, in 1619, just 12 years after the founding of Jamestown, the first shipment of African slaves arrived in Virginia. So the company probably would have continued to struggle along if they hadn't found something that people really loved. Tobacco. Tobacco had been grown in Mexico since at least 1000 BCE, but the Europeans had never seen it, and it proved to be kind of a thank you for the small box, here's some lung cancer gift from the natives. Interestingly, King James hated smoking. He called it a custom loathsome to the eye and hateful to the nose, but he loved him some tax revenue, and nothing sells like drugs. By 1624, Virginia was producing more than 200,000 pounds of tobacco per year. By the 1680s, more than 30 million pounds per year. Tobacco was so profitable that colonists created huge plantations with very little in the way of towns or infrastructure to hold the social order together, a strategy that always works out brilliantly. The industry also structured Virginian society. First off, most of the people who came in the 17th century, three quarters of them were servants. So Virginia became a microcosm of England, a small class of wealthy landowners sitting atop a mass of servants. That sounds kind of dirty, but it was mostly just sad. The society was also overwhelmingly male, because male servants were more useful in the tobacco fields, they were the greatest proportion of immigrants. In fact, they outnumbered women five to one. The women who did come over were mostly indentured servants, and if they were to marry, which they often did because they were in great demand, they had to wait until their term of service was off. This meant delayed marriage, which meant fewer children, which further reduced the number of females. Life was pretty tough for these women, but on the upside, Virginia was kind of a swamp of pestilence, so their husbands often died. And that created a small class of widows, or even unmarried women, who because of their special status, could make contracts and own property, so that was good, sort of. Okay, a quick word about Maryland. Maryland was the second Chesapeake colony founded in 1632, and by now there was no messing around with joint stock companies. Maryland was a proprietorship, a massive land grant to a 
a single individual named Cecilius Calvert. Calvert wanted to turn Maryland into like a medieval feudal kingdom to benefit himself and his family, and he was no fan of the representational institutions that were developing in Virginia. Also, Calvert was Catholic, and Catholics were welcome in Maryland, which wasn't always the case elsewhere. Speaking of which, let's talk about Massachusetts. So James Dunn might have been Before the first Massachusetts, I think I want to emphasize that about Maryland. Um, Maryland, in a way, became kind of a haven for Catholics. Now, I will, there's a quiz question that's a little tricky. There's two quiz questions that trip you up. One is more about like what was the predominant denomination in Maryland. It's not the Catholics. But what was one of the only colonies that welcomed Catholics in Maryland? So it's tricky. Be careful with that one. Um, but yeah, just a little fun fact, Maryland uh, Catholics and all that. So. Massachusetts Bay is probably better now. This is largely because the colonists who came there were so recognizable for their beliefs and also for their hats. That's right, I'm talking about the pilgrims and the Puritans. And no, I will not be talking about Thanksgiving. It's a lie. I can't help myself, but only to clear up the difference between pilgrims and Puritans and yeah. also to talk about Squanto. God, I'd love me some Squanto. Let's go to the thought bubble. Most of the English men and women who settled in New England were uber Protestant Puritans who believed the Protestant Church of England was still too Catholic even. It's needling and incense and extravagantly had in archbishops in particular. And these Puritans actually go all the way back to the 1500s in, in England. Actually, they even go real. If you want to go back as far as its origin, it goes back to Henry VIII and they stopped from the Church of England, the England Church, and all that. But um, this goes back to Cromwell, the English Civil War, and then essentially this was a religious group, very, very strict religious group that did not get along well with other religious groups, uh, even other Christian groups. They were very, very much isolated. So you see a lot of these people coming over to Massachusetts Bay because they essentially want to create a new colony, a new city on a hill. So you probably heard that speech. So. Puritans, who by the way did not call themselves that, other people did, who settled in New England were called Congregationalists because they thought congregations should determine leadership and worship structures, not bishops. The pilgrims were even more extreme. They wanted to separate the royalists completely from the Church of England. So first they fled to the Netherlands, but the Dutch were apparently too corrupt for them, so they rounded up investors and financed a new colony in 1620. They were supposed to land in Virginia, but in what perhaps should have been taken as an omen, they were blown wildly off course and ended up in what's now Massachusetts, founding a colony called Plymouth. While still on board their ship, the Mayflower, 41 of the 150 or so colonists wrote and signed an agreement called the Mayflower Compact, in which they all bound themselves to follow, quote, just and equal laws that their chosen representatives would write up. Since this was the first written framework for government in the U.S., it's kind of a big deal. But anyway, the Pilgrims had the excellent fortune of landing in Massachusetts with six weeks before winter, and they had the good sense not to bring very much food with them or any farm animals. Half of them died before winter was out. The only reason they didn't all die was that local Indians led by Squanto gave them food and saved them. A year later, grateful that they had survived mainly due to the help of an alliance with the local chief Massasoit, and because the Indians had taught them how to plant corn and where to catch fish, the Pilgrims held a big feast, the first Thanksgiving. Thanks, Thought And by the way, that feast was on the fourth Thursday in November, not mid-October, as is celebrated in some of these green areas we call not America. Anyways, Squanto was a pretty amazing character, and not only because he helped save the Pilgrims. He found that almost all of his tribe, the Patuxent, had been wiped out by disease, and eventually settled with the Pilgrims on the site of his former village, and then died of disease. Because this is another important thing I want to go over, is the the varying tribes of Native Americans. You gotta understand, I'm sure most of you do already, but like it's very important to understand that not all tribes are the same. Not all Indians were the same, not all Native Americans were the same. Just, that was not a thing. That there were so many diverse cultures and tribes, and Europeans interacted with each of them very differently. Some of them got along pretty well. In fact, if you look up the I think Paul Johnson mentions it briefly, but if you look up the Moravians, you might have heard the term, they said a lot of the Carolina area, North Carolina, that area. They got along with the Indians splendidly, just absolutely coexisting and doing well. For a while, the Pilgrims got along with Native Americans here, but then you look at some other examples, Jamestown, they did not get along with the Indians very well. That's kind of known. You probably saw the movie, Disney movie, Pocahontas. That's a very nice BS version of what happened. So it was much worse than that. Um, but yeah, just to give you an idea, this is very important to understand that you may also see this on your quizzes and stuff, which is the diversity of Native American culture. It was just super, super multicultural. Because it is always ruining everything. So the Pilgrims struggled on until 1691 when their colony was subsumed by the larger and much more successful Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was chartered in 1629 by London merchants who, like the founders of the Virginia Company, hoped to make money. But unlike Virginia, the Board of Directors relocated from England to America, which meant that in Massachusetts they had a greater degree of autonomy and self-government than they did in Virginia. Social unity was also much more important in Massachusetts than it was in Virginia. The Puritans' religious mission meant that the common good was at 
least at first, put above the needs or the rights of the individual. Those different ideas in the North and South about the role of government would continue until now. Oh God, it's time for the mystery document. The rules are simple. I read the mystery document, which I have not seen before. If I get it right, then I do not get shot with this shot pen. If I get it wrong, I do. All right. We must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities. Superfluities? I don't know. For the supply of others' necessities, we must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The uh, eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. Alright, first thing I notice, the author of this document is a terrible speller, or possibly wrote this before English was standardized. Also, a pretty religious individual. And the community in question seems to embrace something near socialism, abridging the superfluous for others' necessities. Also, it says that the community should be like a city upon a hill, like a model for everybody. And because of that metaphor, I know exactly where it comes from. The sermon, a model of Christian charity by John Winthrop. Yes! Yes! Okay. So, before I get continues on, we're getting close to the end here. I want to stress a very, very important difference. And uh, before I, well, before I stress, let me ask a question. Name me one of the major differences, or some of the major differences, between the Jamestown colony and the Massachusetts Bay colony. Based on what you've seen here. Massachusetts was very religious. Jamestown was more money. Okay, yeah, no, that's a good one. Okay, so Jamestown was really more concerned about money base. They were really more concerned about making money and getting home. Massachusetts was concerned with establishing a religious center, a place where uh, people could come, a city on a hill. So, which colony was more equipped to stay? The Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Bay. Jamestown was not really concerned with staying very long, uh, and it showed, um, and, it, and it hurt them. Uh, but Massachusetts Bay, they started out with the, with the intention of, we're going to be here, we're going to stay here for a long time. Uh, it's kind of interesting how the futures of both of these colonies went, because really Jamestown, over time, ended up doing better. It took them a while, but they ended up doing better over time, establishing an argument Massachusetts Bay kind of broke up a bit. It's still, it's still very much part of Massachusetts and all that area, but it's interesting how they started out with their intentions, but then reversed their, their establishments in a way. So that's very important. It may even be a, an essay question, I think. It's one of the ones, like, what's the difference between the colonies? So you're going to want to know the differences between, like, Massachusetts Bay and Jamestown. And uh, I can't believe I guessed Bradford over Winthrop because I know Winthrop and my brain just was like, Pilgrim, Pilgrim. No, it's Puritan. So Winthrop is the Puritan, Bradford is the Pilgrim. Sermons in American history. It shows us just how religious the Puritans were, but it also shows us that their religious mission wasn't really one of individualism, but of collective effort. In other words, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. But this city on a hill metaphor is the basis for one kind of American exceptionalism, the idea that we are so special and so godly that we will be a model to other nations. At least as long, according to Winthrop, as we act together. Let's do think Winthrop's words were forgotten. They did become the centerpiece of Ronald Reagan's 1989 farewell address. Okay, so New England towns were governed democratically, but that doesn't mean that the Puritans were big on equality or that everybody was able to participate in government because the only people who could vote or hold office were church members, and to be a full church member, you had to be a, quote, visible saint. So really, power stayed in the hands of the church elite. The same went for equality. Well, it was better than in the Chesapeake colonies or England, as equality went uh, pretty unequal. As John Winthrop declared, some must be rich and some poor, some high and eminent in power and dignity, others mean and in subjection. Or as historian Eric Foner put it, inequality was considered an expression of God's will, and while some liberties applied to all inhabitants, there were separate lists of rights for freemen, women, children, and servants. There was also slavery in Massachusetts. The first slaves were recorded in the colony in 1640. However, Puritans really did foster equality in one sense. They wanted everyone to be able to read the Bible. In fact, parents could be punished by the town councils for not properly instructing their children and making them literate. So when Roger Williams called for citizens to be able to practice any religion they chose, he was banished from the colony. So was Anne Hutchinson.
Anderson, who argued that church membership should be based on inner grace and not on outward manifestations like church attendance. Williams went on to found Rhode Island, so that worked out fine for him. But Hutchinson, who was doubly threatening to Massachusetts because she was a woman preaching unorthodox ideas, was too radical and was further banished to Westchester, New York, where she and her family were killed by Indians. Finally, someone who doesn't die of disease or starvation. So fast to just think of their country as being founded by pioneers of religious freedom who were seeking liberty from the oppressive English. We've already seen that's only partly true. For one thing, Puritan ideas of equality and representation weren't particularly equitable or representational. In truth, America was also founded by indigenous people and by Spanish settlers, and the earliest English colonies weren't about religion, they were about money. We'll see this tension between American mythology and American history again next week, and also every week. Okay. Thanks for watching. So, see you next time. Um, any questions or like interesting things you didn't know or something you want to point out? Yes. Well, it, it, it's not like, I wouldn't even say it's an official word. It's one that Johnson kind of made, as far as I know. He's the only author I've ever seen that uses it. Uh, and Dr. Melton also uses it because I think he likes the word. I like it too. It, it makes sense. The idea that, you know, kind of America before America existed. Like, was there an American spirit before we just signed that, you know, Declaration of Independence? Um, and I think, yeah, I think that a lot of the attitudes that we have today kind of stem from our early colonial history, which is pro America. So I like that word. Um, okay, so that being said, I think we have some time to play Jeopardy. So let's let's go over some of the stuff you're going to see. Uh, we literally have six people, which is perfect. So we'll do team one, team two, team three. We'll do you know you, you know the drill of Jeopardy. Um, I have one question. Yes. For the um. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. But I want to turn one of these lights on so I can see. Okay. Go ahead. You can go with your question. Okay. 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 Okay, well, if you think about it, let me know. Alright, so, um, you know the, the drill is basically you've got to raise your hand to answer the question. Don't just blurt out the answer. Make sure you uh, let me read the question all the way through. Um, this doesn't have to be as competitive because we don't have as much time. We might get through most of them, we might not. So, um, next week we should actually have a little bit more time to play and have fun, and we'll see one of these weeks last night. Should we do that with that's actually not a bad idea because there may be some things we need to go over on your college page. So I will encourage you in this class to bring your laptops. We may or may not hash them out. It depends. If we actually get extra time in this class, I don't know if we will because we have so much to cover every week. If we get time in the class, I may give you like 10 minutes to do a working class on some discussion starting or something like that. You know, that, that might be a good thing. We'll see. All right. So team one, uh, go ahead and pick a category. Um, early religion. Okay. Uh, which ones? 100? 200, 300, 400, 500, 600? 200. Okay. Maryland contained a majority section of Protestants. However, it was also designed to be a haven for this religious group. Catholics. Yes. Everyone just went over that. So that's one of those tricky ones because there's two questions on that. So it is Catholics. Very good. Yep. Okay. Do you want You're already ahead, so give us another shot. And just FYI, I think almost all the Jeopardy games will have this lecture category, so this is obviously from the lectures. So uh, I encourage you to look ahead every week and make sure you've covered the lectures for that week before playing the game, make sure you've done the reading, and you'll do better in Jeopardy. Um, grab bags, obviously, a mixture of everything. So, and so lecture, what points is it? Proto American 200. Oh, Proto American 200, okay. This man is often considered to be a proto-American due to his adventurous nature, his suppression of foreign culture, the Irish, and his founding of the Roanoke Colony. I actually mentioned him. Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, yes, Sir Walter Raleigh. Yeah. Doing good, all right. See, this team listens. I don't know what you're so. <laughs> All right. Uh, team one, get to pick again. Early Colonies 300. Early Colonies 300. Just like, are you doing a diagonal? Is that what's going on? No. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the Spanish experienced great success in their colonization of America with few setbacks. This is a true or false question. True. No, not quite. Majorly false. So the Spanish uh, were probably, you could argue, the most disagreeable Europeans to men uh, because they did not get along with almost anybody. Uh, they were constantly trying to suppress the Indians through religious force uh, and other and military. You can look at Cortez, De Soto. It's it's they were pretty rough. 
Um, so in this regard, no, the Spanish did not have an easy go of it. Um, Alrighty, so let's see, let's do another chant. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the opposite of Ireland, go T3. Uh, let's do early colonies 400. Early colonies 400, okay. This Englishman was a 16th century writer who greatly supported the pursuit of mercantilism and colonial expansion. If you didn't do the readings yet, you, you, good chance you won't get it. Can I think of the Englishman that I knew you might have heard of him. It's okay if nobody knows this because, like I said, first week I know we're kind of getting introduced to stuff. So if you don't know it, make sure you write it down. I'll give you time to write it down. Um, Is that one? Yeah, everyone picks up a pencil. I don't know. What. Not 
preach. It wasn't a thing. So there's this woman kind of coming out of nowhere and making a major impact on religious views at the time, uh, certainly later on. Um, so but no, in this case, it is false. So something to look up might be something to write a paper about. Um, all right, so we'll go back to team three. Let's do grab bag 300. Okay, mix it up a little bit. Johnson describes this movement as the midwife to American Christianity. So I want you to think of a major religious movement that happened in early colonial America. It was pretty great. Wasn't it like a big like movement? Like religion? Yeah. Like I want to say the Great Awakening. Okay. Good. Yeah. I really was scared of the Great Awakening. So, Johnson describes the Great Awakening as the midwife, or in other words, that that gave birth to essentially modern American Christianity. Um, there was actually two Great Awakenings. There was the first one, which was super powerful, and then the second one, which not so much. It was there. Some things changed. There were definitely a lot of like smaller movements that branched out of it that are still around today. It did not do as much. The Great Awakening like completely altered how uh, America looked at. Christianity. So our, our version of Christianity, I mean, we still follow the Bible, but it's definitely not the same traditional versions that you would see like in even England today, like uh, Europe and stuff. Um, it's just different. Uh, we definitely, I, I want to say we came up with things like revivals and stuff like that. Um, that all happened in the Great Awakening, whereas you wouldn't see that in Europe. Okay, uh, team two. Oh, I'm sorry, you got that right. I should have that <laughs> Never mind, team three. You caught me talking. I was more along. So. Uh, let's do grab bag 200. Okay, we had success with that, so let's see if we have any. This author wrote Manalia Christi Americana, which is arguably the first great American work of literature. Oh, we should know this one. No, we study American literature. It's somewhat obviously like. Hmm. I always forget this one, too. It's, it's just not one that you're this tall very often. I feel like I remember the name. I remember reading this somewhere, sometime recently. I can't remember. Oof. I love how all this is like long for I don't know it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is totally fine. So, you want to reveal this one? Yeah, let's okay. reveal this one. So, so yeah. Cotton Mather. I should know that. Ah, I remember reading that. And Cotton Mather is an interesting figure. In American history, so very interesting. He was also, I believe, part of the Salem witch trials, witch hunter. He was a kind of a cool, but also really creepy dude at the same time. He was a little bit of both. So, all right. So, if you don't know this one, write down Magnolia Christi Americana, Cotton Mather. When you get into the Salem Witch Trials, which I, I think we, uh, Johnson definitely does cover, uh, that's that's an interesting one to consider for a paper subject because, wow, it's a weird portion of our history. Okay. Um, didn't he start, start off as a minister? Or was kind of. His dad was, I think. Yeah. I just wrote that one here. Yeah, he's, he was a uh, very accomplished, very intelligent person, but also very religiously zealous, like super religious. Um, and some interesting things is this goes back to the Puritan culture, this idea of witches and witchcraft, and they had to be, you know, suffer not a witch to live. Um, there is actually an interesting horror movie. I'm not condoning that you watch it, but the plot is very, very uh, interesting. It's called The Witch, or if you want to look at the title, it's called The Witch, and it's actually set in Puritan America. Um, and it's this isolated Puritan family who are extremely superstitious. Um, and there is an actual witch in the woods, and it, it's, it's pretty dark, and, you know, like I said, I don't condone watching it, but the one thing I did like about the film is that the director was very careful to be sensitive to Puritan history, so when you're watching this family, it's very authentic at the time, like, what the beliefs were, so it, it's, they were hardworking, self-sufficient, but they were also, like, really creeped out by a lot of stuff, and just very strict about their beliefs, um, very superstitious. So, it's one of those interesting ones. All right, um, so, team two. Now I think you need to go. I went last time, your turn. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, early Religion 300. Okay. Early Religion 300. All right. He was a prominent preacher who hailed from two 
intellectual fam families and became a witch hunter due to his scientific interests. Was that Bobby Yeah, sometimes you're going to see the same answer. Like I said, this guy kind of got around. He, he did a lot of stuff. So, and to answer your question, he was a minister, so, yeah. I was thinking of his father, but I'm pretty sure he was also a minister, and that's what's sticking in my head, so. Um, all right, so D2, you actually get a chance here. Uh, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Proto-America 300. So what? Proto-America 300. Proto-America 300, all right. American Indians were surprisingly homogenous and all spoke a similar language. False. Yeah, that's a pretty hard false. Yeah. All right. Team two. Okay. Grab back four hundred. Grab back four hundred. All right. Plymouth colonists came to view or came to the New World to create God's kingdom on Earth. John Winthrop summarized his vision of the colony with this descriptive title. The city of Plymouth. Ooh, very good. Nice. City on it. All right. Was you know what it was? Um, all right, you too. You're starting to pull ahead here, so. I went last time. Right on America 400. Right, right on America 400. According to Johnson, the flag that you lived under was more important than the settling of land ownership and land. Okay, so this is according to the author, by the way. According to Paul Johnson, the flag that you lived under was more important than the fact that you basically own land to most Americans. Another way of asking is to, to or not Americans, but to early colonists, was it more important the flag that you lived under, in other words, the country that you quote came from, or the fact that you lived on land and it was your land and blah blah? I want to say it was more important for them that they have land, but I'm not sure. I think you're right. Let's check it. Maybe false. Settlement was the primary goal, so you are right. It was oh, right. right. And you were yeah. So oh. in other words, the flag was not more important. A oh. lot of and Johnson makes the point. A lot of Early colonists not so much lost their loyalty to the crown, but really didn't think, uh, didn't worry about it. It was kind of like, yeah, technically I'm English, but they're not over here doing anything for me. I'm living on my own. A lot of people were living on the frontier. They weren't even, a lot of them weren't even paying taxes because it's like, I'm living on my own. No, no, there's no reason to pay taxes. I'm self sufficient. So, yes. So, good job. This also contributed to some of the earlier ideas toward independence in the uh, 17th and 18th century because the more strict that England got with the colonists, the more kind of mad they got because like, look, well, we've been carrying ourselves and doing just fine and you're just adding all these taxes on. Now I will say, I'm gonna go a little bit of a tangent here before we get back. This, this is kind of a back and forth, like talking about perspective. We're talking about this in the syllabus, like what perspective? Well, if you look at the French and Indian War, uh, which was also called the Seven Years' War and is actually the first World War, yes, even before World War One, and was also started by. Can anyone guess? This is a fun one. Who was the Who was the perpetrator of the very first World War? Uh, I Close. I'm thinking of an actual individual, a very famous American individual. I know what you're talking about. Oh, a lot of people don't oh know this. Close their minds. I'll give you another hint. He was one of the founding fathers. Awesome. Yes. He was the perpetrator of the First World War. Um, he actually was uh, looking for a French uh, diplomat, and essentially there was an altercation between George Washington's Native American uh, allies, uh, his military, because he was in a militia, and then the French, and that escalated, and he let it escalate, arguably he wanted it to escalate, the George Washington was the same guy, and that sparked multiple conflicts across the whole globe. It started a, for the first official world war. So yeah, first world war. Not World War I, but the first world war, war, which was the French and Indian War slash Seven Years War was started by George Washington. Anyway, I say all that to say this, that because of that war, the British had to spend a lot of money and military power to basically protect their colonies. And then they basically said to the American colonies, hey, we were hoping you could pay us some of that back now that we've won. And they're like, I'll get back to you on that. In other words, we ain't paying anything. But thanks for the help. And as you can imagine, the British were not very happy about that, so they started taxing the Americans heavily. 
and it got worse and worse, and that escalated. So when we talk about the American War for Independence, no taxation representation, you could argue that the Americans kind of didn't help that situation. So it's one of those both perspectives. All right, so moving on, we still got a few more minutes. So let's see, Team Two, you've been rocking it. So, so go again. Bostonian Governor William Phipps set up a special court to investigate claims from this controversial, uh, controversial event. It's a five hundred one. It's a bit tougher. Is it the same as Just FYI, get the reading up for this week, but also go ahead and get the reading up for next week and just try to come prepared to class from now on out. Um, and we'll help you with these and also we'll just you'll be better prepared for the quizzes. So, Because uh, if you don't know a lot of these, there's a good chance you won't be ready for the quizzes because these are from the quizzes. All right, so this in uh, the Salem was strong. Yes, so I guess actually, I'm giving it to you because you did guess it right. That was the only controversial. I thought that and, uh, Yeah, I mean, no, no, there were other controversial, but that was the big one. That was that for sure. That was like, there was really that many, like, big. Mm -hmm. you know, So I'm gonna y'all been doing great, but I'm gonna give the other team a chance to pick. So team one. So I think team two kind of crushed this one. Actually, <laughs> what you did to 